Today we're going to talk about preparing for the end of maintenance of RHEL 7. RHEL 7 is a venerable Red Hat release. It's been around for a long time, but now the time has come, sadly, my friends, to move on to bigger and better things. And my friend Bob Mater and I are going to tell you about that. Bob, if you could just introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Bob Mater. Uh, I work here at Red Hat. I've been here about a year uh, prior to Red Hat. I uh, did uh, Linux uh, for Banks on Wall Street. And um, yeah, so I have decades of experience um, managing pets in the data center. Yeah, hopefully they're not all pets. Hopefully some of them are also cattle, but we'll talk about that as we go. <laughs> and I'm Bob Handlin, and I like to make noise in front of people, as you may have noticed already. I ran the product experience for in-place upgrades, which is what we're going to tell you about today as one possible way of getting from where you are to where you need to be with your real estate. So what we're going to talk about today is there's a challenge here. Rel 7 maintenance ends in the middle of 2024. The solution, as we're going to map out today, is if you have some of the pets that Bob was referring to, if you're in a larger organization, you do some stepwise planning, automation, and then you can run out rolling upgrades and get to where you need to be by the time you need to be there. We're also going to discuss how in the future this can all be easier because everything we tell you about today is extensible into the future, and we'll explain that as well. And finally, as we get into some of the nuts and bolts here, just realize that this is a simplification process. You can do this and you may not get it all in the first minute, but if you pay attention to what we're saying here, we feel like we can make your life a lot easier and make you very productive in moving machines forward in time. So again, we said the challenge is RHEL 7 maintenance ends in the middle of 2024. And lifecycle management has always been daunting. Red Hat releases go across multiple versions of the Linux kernel. And um, therefore, in the past, maybe some of our customers would do major upgrades as an excuse, like they'd buy some new hardware, maybe get rid of a whole bunch of old problems at the same time. But increasingly, because of virtualization and because hardware and software are separated now, our customers are telling us they're going to use in-place upgrades this time. In fact, a lot of the stuff Bob and I are going to talk to you about today started with the big banks who have many tens of thousands of systems, let's say, and they're striving to make every system upgradable using only in-place upgrades. And the underlying reason for that is the one we mentioned, that the hardware and software are really separated from each other at this point. But it requires preparation. We have a leap tool. You may have heard of it. That's not going to get you there all by itself. There's a lot of company specific software on these machines in many cases, and there's manually applied configuration. This is how pets are born, we would say. And then you need some consistent, reliable backup and restore capabilities. Lots of people have backups. Not everybody can restore. And then gaining the cooperation in a big organization can be difficult too. So how do you solve for that? You need a consistent framework for both your current and your future upgrades. And I wanna say one more important thing here. If your environment and your machines are simple enough, you may not need any of this, and we like to point that out, but if you have a more sophisticated and complex environment, these are the kind of steps you can use to make the process simple uh, really across everything you're doing. So again, stepwise planning, automation, and then rolling upgrades. And I'm gonna hand the baton over to Bob now. This is uh, his favorite slide. He can tell you a little bit more. Yeah, this is my favorite slide. Um, so. What we're talking about here is an automation approach for doing RHEL in-place upgrades, taking that RHEL 7 host and magically turning it into a RHEL 8 host without having to touch your applications or deploy a new OS or change anything that, that is going to impact your business. Um, and there's four key features we're going to talk about today that make this successful at scale. And yeah, I'm talking about tens of thousands of RHEL hosts at some of these big enterprise customers. Um, obviously, automate everything, right? End-to-end -end automation and make that automation available as an easy to use self-service push button for whoever the users of that automation are gonna be, whether that's your operations teams or maybe it's your app managers, uh, maybe in, in your development environments, it's your developers. But make the RHEL in-place upgrade automation easy for them to use. 
Um, the next feature we'll talk about is automated snapshot and rollback capability. This is the most important feature in my opinion. It's also, uh, in my experience, the most difficult feature to get right. And we'll talk about uh, what some of the uh, options are there and, and how to make it easier. Um, custom modules. Uh, what this means really is, is automation to wrap around that leap framework, right? The leap framework is what actually upgrades the OS from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8, but there's other things that need to be upgraded in your environment. There's other things, the uh, configurations that need to be changed and, and so forth. So the custom modules is the custom automation that is gonna make the end-to-end -end automation of in-place upgrades work in your environment for your special collection of tools and agents and middleware and whatever you've got out there. And then the last thing, and this is this is also a really important one for kind of for selling the solution within your organization um, is a reporting dashboard. Let's have a dashboard that shows, hey, how many upgrades are getting done, you know, every week, every month using this automation. So we can see the progress of, of upgrades, see the progress of, of reducing the size of that RHEL 7 estate, uh, you know, hopefully in time for the end of maintenance. And then also the reporting dashboard can have um, reporting capabilities for showing the results of pre-upgrade reports. Because when you do an upgrade, you run a pre-upgrade report that says, hey, is this host ready to go or are there issues we need to look at? And it makes it easy to have some visibility around that as well. And so we'll get into all of this in more detail. Sure thing. Um, so what are we doing here? We're building an upgrade automation environment. Again, we're extending outside of sort of that leap piece that sits in the middle. And the extent to which you need to do this is going to depend a lot on the size of your company, of course. But all of these can be applied at either a small scale or a large scale. The biggest question is how complex it gets. So um, I'm not going to spend time walking through the details on this slide because we're going to kind of walk through each piece of this as we go. So the first step is to analyze your environment. Now, Bob, what do we mean by analyze? Right, so this is uh, something that uh, the Leap tool provides. It's a pre-upgrade report, and it's going to look, it's gonna basically scan your host, your RHEL 7 host, and say, oh, look, here's, here's some, I, I, I've, discovered some conditions that may be a risk for going ahead with an upgrade. And what we're looking at here is an example of, of one of those reports. And you'll see there's a bunch of different findings. And some are, you know, low findings or information level findings, there's a medium finding, and then there are some high findings. And in this example, there are even some findings called inhibitors. And what an inhibitor finding means uh, is that's a barrier to even being able to go forward with the uh, upgrade. The leap tool will not, it will block you from doing an in-place upgrade if there are any inhibitor findings. And so you go through these findings and figure out what, what's causing them. And, and if you drill down in the report, it'll have remediation hints that tell you, recommend how to fix the, the issues that have been identified. And as you develop your automation solution, you may find that some of these inhibitors come up with every upgrade. And if that's happening, then that's where that custom automation that you're going to do can, can take care of mitigating those inhibitors before you even run the pre-upgrade report or just before you start the uh, upgrade automation and then you can ignore those. And there are different ways that you can work around those. Um, the other thing is with your custom modules, you can add more checks to this pre-upgrade report. So the Leap tool, as it comes from Red Hat, has you know a big library of checks that are relevant to the RHEL OS and the packages and all of that sort of thing. But but maybe you need to add some additional checks because there are conditions in your environment on some you know, percentage of, of your rel estate that you want to be able to check for because, I don't know, you're using some configuration management and if it's not correctly registered, you don't want the upgrade to go forward or whatever. And you can add those checks and then they'll appear in the pre-upgrade report on your reporting dashboard as well. 
Okay, step two, and again, we said this is probably the most important piece of all, create some way to roll back the system in the event of a failure. And there are a few ways to do this, aren't there, Bob? <laughs> yeah, there sure are. Um, and and it's, it's, it's kind of pros and cons, it's trade-offs, right? Um, I like LVM snapshots. LVM is the logical volume manager of the RHEL operating system. Um, it's a pretty robust capability that you know, most people except your low level RHEL infrastructure geeks don't even know is there because it just works. But it has a snapshot capability that enables you to snapshot some or all of the file systems in your RHEL host so that if something does go wrong, if the upgrade fails, or after the upgrade finishes and the upgrade successful, but the app team says, hey, you messed up our application, uh, you can use those snapshots to roll back, take it right back to where you started, and everything's good, and you you, you save the day because the application impact isn't going to impact the business because you got the environment back up within your maintenance window. Now, let's talk about some of the other kinds of snapshots. I said I like LVM snapshots, and that's because they they exist within the domain of the RHEL OS. You have control over uh, doing how much you snapshot, uh, how much space you're going to need to take for those snapshots. It's all within the, the RHEL OS. Um, but a lot of people, especially if you're, most of your RHEL estate is on VMware, say, Bob, what about VMware snapshots? They're so great because they're super easy and they just cover everything. And like LVM, you got to do special janky things for the boot partition and yada, yada. And, and VM snapshots just seem so easy. And yeah, VM snapshots are great in that they do capture the entire state of that VM at the moment that you create the snapshot and they'll take you back to that entire state and including like what's in memory when the thing's running and everything right that's great but there's a couple challenges that you're going to have to think about first of all does the vmware team have the storage capacity in their environment to be able to support those snapshots because that storage capacity isn't in your guest OS. It's coming from outside your guest OS and the data stores that are running VMware and they may not have very much headroom on those. Um, another thing is, is that VMware team gonna give you access to the vSphere API. And in a lot of customers I've seen it's like, oh no, you can't touch that. Well, you gotta handle that manually, I'm sorry. And so, you know, Prepare yourself for, for those kinds of battles. Um, the other thing that you sh should be aware of if you're going to do VMware snapshots is you can't just do snapshots of the operating system volumes or virtual disks. It's all or nothing, which means if you've got a VM that's like a database server and it's got a terabyte of virtual disk for that database, that snapshot is going to include everything, including all of that business data. And so the, then the app team says, oh, we discovered three days after the upgrade that there's impact and we want to roll back. They're going to wind up rolling back all of their data too. That can be a real problem. Uh, there are a few other kinds of snapshots. Uh, there's something here on the slide about break mirror, which is kind of a, uh, a clever way to, to do snapshots for bare metal servers that have hardware RAID. Um, if you're on the public cloud, like EC2 instances, you can to use Amazon EBS to do snapshots. Um, the, uh, there's a utility in RHEL called Rear, which isn't really snapshots, but it does a pretty good job of enabling you to quickly do a full backup and restore, um, easier than some of the third-party backup products. So those are all other options that you can look at um, as you assess what's the best way to do snapshots. And of course, the theme for all of them is quick recovery, get yourself back in business. That's the advantage over a full backup. Exactly, Bob. Snapshots are, <clears throat> the, the, creating the snapshot and rolling back the snapshot is essentially instantaneous, as opposed to doing a full backup and a full recovery of a server, which you know can take hours or 
however you know exactly. however much data there is and, and how how close it is um snapshots you know people tell you snapshots are not a replacement for backups and that's true because with snapshots the the, the backed up data is essentially right there with the rest of the data so in a, from a disaster recovery perspective snapshots aren't good but for a maintenance activity like doing an that's employee right. upgrade right. snapshots are really it's a really good use case for for snapshots 100 percent so next, we're going to develop the custom modules. Now, we're talking Ansible because Ansible is the most familiar environment, but you might have other automation tools, but the ideas are, are, are the same. You want to have uh, individual ways to deal with various things you might run into based on the application type. So, Bob, why don't you run through some that you, you, you've done this before? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um... The uh, the automation, I mean, at the heart of it, it's going to run the leap tool to do the OS upgrade. But then we talked about all the tools and agents that you've got, right? And uh, particularly with the, the big enterprise customers, they've got a huge collection of tools and agents that's standard across every rel instance in their whole estate. And if you look at the list of products on, on the left-hand side of this slide, um, you know, show of hands, how many of you have at least uh, half a dozen of these uh, as part of your standard RHEL build? Um, a lot of these products need additional automation so that they get upgraded as well or reconfigured or re-registered or, or whatever it is. Um, for, for some of these project products, it's really easy. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, upgrading the the software package that installs that product for for others it's it's more complicated um you know if you're talking about database servers clustering um and uh uh configuration management like puppet or chef you know you have to change your your run list and your cookbooks and all of that um but this is the custom automation that you're going to do to to make your rel in place upgrades work end and automated so that when your customers go to that self-service push button it just works cool and then as you're doing this you want to be able to track progress right right and that's uh, where we get into talking about the uh, uh, reporting dashboard um, and uh, yeah, so the reporting dashboard is going to show your pre-upgrade results when you run pre-upgrades. It's going to show your um, uh, completed upgrades over time. And and it also is the ability to show you like the state of, uh, to summarize all of your real estate. So let's say you do pre-upgrades as a batch activity, you, you, maybe you have a schedule where you do patching and updates on your real estate every, I don't know, every patch Tuesday or whatever it is. And and then um, maybe you decide, hey, let's run pre-upgrade reports at the same time. Now you've got all these pre-upgrade reports and the dashboard can show you, oh, look, 80% uh, of my estate is free of inhibitors and, and good to upgrade, but these other 20% have issues that we weren't expecting and we have to look at those pre-upgrade reports and then you can drill down to the pre-upgrade reports for the ones that have issues wonderful wonderful stuff now it's done now we get to start upgrading this is the big moment this is when you've already talked to all the people in the application environment you've talked to your application owners you've talked to the boss and Maybe you even created a button that the uh, owner of the application can push themselves, right? Yeah, Bob. Uh, so this is really just another view of the upgrade automation workflow, right? And you see the analysis phase, that's the pre-upgrade, the upgrade phase, and the commit phase. And so... In the analysis phase, you're running the pre-upgrade report, and maybe you have to iterate on that pre-upgrade report to deal with the findings that are reported. But when that upgrade report looks good and, and everybody's happy with the um, the risk findings that are still there, you go ahead and say, okay, let's move on to the upgrade phase. Um, and now you're gonna run the Ansible playbooks that are gonna do your upgrade. And there's gonna be a workflow that does create the snapshot 
and then run the upgrade playbook and the custom modules. And now the server is ready for the app teams to do their assessment to say, oh, has, has our pet application, is it still functioning as expected? Um, and you know what, 99 times out of 100, it will be because the business application, it's, it's, it's high level application. It's abstracted away from all the low level infrastructure by a runtime like Java or by the excellent forward binary compatibilities of the rel system libraries. So it's gonna still work most of the time. But if there's an issue, you've got the ability to do that rollback. You hit that rollback button, the rollback playbook is gonna merge those snapshots back to the origin and you're right back where you started. And you can you can assess, okay, what caused that to fail? What can we do to prepare for that and try again? Um, that rollback capability is also really important when you're developing the automation solution because you can iterate through failures over and over again to figure out what's going wrong, add that, Add, add the required mitigations to your custom automation and try it over and over and over again. And so the rollback capability is really the first thing you want to get working because then that enables you to quickly develop and and enhance the, the automation that's going to make this whole flow go reliably every time. And then I think... Uh... We, 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 there's the delete stuff that you have a commit phase at the end there, but then once you get all of that working and everyone's testing and when their upgrades are complete, they may be deleting that last snap. Now you start to ramp up and the ramp up is an interesting part of the process too. Also one that you've lived through. Yeah. So, um, honestly, this graph is from when I did uh rel 6 to rel 7 upgrade automation back in 2019 at my former employer on wall street and we, so what you see in on the left of that graph is we started in june and we took a fail fast approach let's just start doing upgrades do upgrades in the dev environment do upgrades in the lab and a lot of them broke you know but it, it was it's the fail fail fast approach and as things broke, we figured out how to fix them. And we added that to the automation. And once we got through that growth phase and had figured out all of those failure modes, the thing just took off because we made it easily available for operations teams and app teams to do as a self-service. And we saw globally across the environment, um, thousands of upgrades happening every month after we got all the kinks worked out and got it working at scale. It's amazing. And then the last bit, you know, that is that once everybody's happy, you get to delete your snapshots and, and you move on uh, and everything's happy and everything you just did to put this amazing set of automations in place can be used next time around too. And that's going to make everything easier next time. You're going to have the leap tool and the surrounding automations and you can use them over and over again. And so as we said at the beginning, that automation you created that automates everything that you're doing, still usable next time. Snapshots and rollbacks, you'll become a master of that. Uh, any custom modules you create with small tweaks are likely to work on the next upgrade as well. And finally, those wonderful reporting uh, dashboards that showed the boss everything was gradually turning green. Those will be there for you next time as well. Um, another thing we recommend is if you start to modernize your environment as you go and start using Red Hat tools a little bit more, you're going to have a more consistent layout on the systems you've deployed. So any system roles that you can use, if you use Insights, if you use Satellite, if you use our web console, all those things are designed to create best practice operations. The more best practices you use, the less variation there is between machines. Then we have a new tool that's growing every day. It's available as a service also called Image Builder. And that allows you to create gold images that you can roll out. And again, they'll be identical, which will make the upgrades so much easier. And then finally, use the opportunity to start migrating your applications to containers as you upgrade. And we're saying don't even refactor them yet. Maybe just run them in Podman, but you're starting to get that sort of a CI CD pipeline thing going where the dependencies that your apps have uh, get pushed up the chain a little bit and the upgrade is less disruptive at the OS level itself. 
the conclusion here is you can do this. Uh, Bob has been living in this world. Bob, tell a little bit about the, the GitHub stuff. Absolutely. Is, is this when I say uh, look for the links in the description below? Uh, Something yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, um, the, uh, we have Ansible roles for Leap upgrades that are upstream uh, a version 1.0 release that happened literally just about a month ago. And those are in Ansible Galaxy now too. Very robust um, Ansible roles for doing uh, the uh, the leap part of the upgrade, something for you to then, you know, enrobe that with your custom automation. Um, there's also examples of custom leap actors, which is the way that you can add custom checks into your pre-upgrade report for things that are specific to your environment. And another upstream repo where um, uh, somebody has contributed a, a new Ansible role for doing LVM snapshots. And this like literally is just, I haven't even had a chance to test it. It's that new. <laughs> but, well, this is um, the beauty of open source, right? I mean, all yeah, these things absolutely. are open. Absolutely. And even if you can't just grab them and use them, you can, like anything you do in development, you can see the model of how it's put together and then you can sort of steal liberally. And that's the whole point. And then hopefully this, this community grows. There'll be more and more things up there. You saw that list of applications earlier. At some point, you'll probably see an automation that someone created for each of those things. And you may find the, a useful answer in there when you go to deploy yourself. And then finally, if you get stuck, if this feels like a bit much um, and you want our help, a lot of this methodology we've talked about today is very well understood in our consulting teams. So if you want to have help doing this, that help is available. And um, as you can see, it's faster deployment and faster upgrades. All this stuff uh, is becoming a, a well-known practice inside of Red Hat. Um, so the, keep, the, the takeaways here are analysis, planning, customization, and automation. It says like a, getting like a broken record at this point. Have your rollback. Use Leap and Ansible because they're wonderful automation tools that make this whole thing simpler once it's set up. Use the Red Hat tools to make it simpler, and then use containers over time to isolate your dependencies. If you're not ready to do that yet, most of our customers say they're at least looking at that. It's, it's something to keep in mind and look into is maybe something you want to add into this process overall. Now, as far as, I guess there will be a look down on most videos, but we also, Bob and I put together this blog before the recent Red Hat Summit that talks about a lot of what you just heard and has some nice links in it. So if you hit this, uh, right here, uh, then you can get access to all of that. And it's sort of a sort of an intro to upgrades and get a little more detail on everything we said here. So with that, I thank you. I thank you, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one.